So my name's Adam. I'm an elder in training here at Beacon Church, and this is our responsive reading where we as a body in Christ confess the faith that unites us in Christ. And this is something we do every week. If you've been here with us for a while, you'll be very familiar. We do this every week uh, using the material of the New City Catechism. This gives us a series of question and answers that seek to systematically summarize what the Bible teaches us, but we don't hold that material itself to be authoritative. Rather, we look to the Bible to teach us about what God would teach us because we hold the Bible to be authoritative, to be inspired and infallible. So we let these questions drive us to what the Bible says. So last week, Andrew was discussing how this, from the scriptures how Jesus, our Redeemer, is both truly human and truly God. And we can see this quickly from Paul's letter to the church in Philippi, where he said, Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking on the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. So in that passage there, we hear Paul describing Jesus both as being in the form of God and in human form. So truly God and truly man. But this week, we follow in the footsteps of my young children and ask, why? But a little more specifically, why must the Redeemer be truly human? And then next week, we ask why he must be truly God. So why must the Redeemer be truly human? Well, back in Genesis 2 and 3, Adam and Eve stood as representatives for all of humanity. They were created in God's image. They were declared very good. They were moral agents without sin. So God gave them a responsibility to obey his command. As we read in Genesis 2, you may surely eat of every tree in the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. And sadly, we know how that turned out, that Eve took the fruit and ate it, and she gave also some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. So they disobeyed God. They, by their actions, they sinned, they fell, they earned death. And this was not just for themselves. We see in Genesis 3 how everything under Adam's dominion was cursed, which includes his descendants, the rest of humanity. And in Exodus chapter 20, we also see at Mount Sinai that God gave the Ten Commandments. That's something we've spent a fair bit of time in these responsive readings going through as well. Um, to summarize, the main point from that is that they are a good summary of God's moral law. They were given to Israel, but they're also required of all humanity. These are not just things that were new and novel at that point. These are things we see as a pattern throughout the whole of Scripture. Yet we've also discussed how all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And that's true even of those stone tablets that God gave to Moses. They didn't even make it to the bottom of the mountain before he smashed them on the ground because of Israel's disobedience, their idolatry, their sin. So from these passages, we see that obeying the law is a human responsibility. We see that humanity disobeyed the law. And we see that humanity owes a moral debt to God, for which the only sufficient punishment is death. So sin and the consequences of sin is a human problem. And so since the law is at the heart of humanity's separation from God, we understand that the Redeemer needed to be human because he needed to fulfill that responsibility of obeying the law, and he also needed to satisfy God's just wrath against humanity for disobeying him for our sin. So we turn our eyes to Jesus. Coming back to Philippians chapter 2, as I was reading a little bit earlier, uh, Paul tells us about Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. But he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed upon him the name that is above every name, so that the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on the earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. So Jesus came in human form, or as we read in Romans, he came in the likeness of sinful flesh, yet without sin. He did not come to abolish the law, as is recorded in Matthew's gospel. Rather, he came to fulfill the law. And in perfectly obeying the law, he earned righteousness. And yet, being righteous, he also suffered death on the cross. So that's why Paul wrote to the church in Rome that God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. By sending his son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, God condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit, which is to say that Jesus perfectly obeyed the law 
yet suffer the punishment for sin that we deserve. And because of this, all who by faith rest in him and his righteous works rather than their own are counted both as forgiven and as righteous. And even more, because Jesus took on human flesh, we find in Jesus that we do not have a high priest who's unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. So let us with confidence then draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find help in time of need. And so with that, I invite you to join me with me in reading the catechism question, which should appear up there. I invite you to stand with me. Um, I will read the question, invite you to join with me in reading the answer. So why must the Redeemer be truly human? That in human nature, he might on our behalf perfectly obey the whole law and suffer the punishment for human sin, and also he might sympathize with our weaknesses. Now just take a moment here to pray. Thank you, Lord, for your grace that you have shown us through your Son. For we recognize that you are a holy God. That is what the angels before your presence say. Of all the attributes of you they could quote, they say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And yet you sent your Son, God in human flesh, to dwell amongst a sinful people. You who are holy, who cannot stand the presence of sin, dwelt amongst a generation of sinners, that you might redeem us. I thank you that you have sent your son who took on our sinfulness, that we by faith might be redeemed through his blood, not by works which we cannot do, but rather, Lord, by faith in the son whom you have sent. Thank you for the grace that you've shown us through him. In Jesus' name, amen.